to be here. Thank you to the team. Wonderful. There's a real sense of celebration in the house. I don't know if you can feel it. I can. I think it's a, it's a great moment and we should be celebrating. It's a great day to be alive. Praise God. Anybody excited? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, I, I've, I've got to say that I miss all the fullness of everybody coming together, but I'm grateful for the fact that we are coming together. I think this is our 10th week or so, roughly, give, us, give or take. We, we opened up on the first possible Sunday, the day after the announcement, and uh, we're grateful for that. There are many churches that haven't reopened. Some have said they're not reopening till next year, and uh, I'll leave all that with others, but I know what God told us to do. So we're here to celebrate around His presence. I think, you know, celebration is around His presence. What you saw on the screen is a, a great moment to just stop and, you know, enjoy life together as a family of God, and uh, we'll continue to celebrate in various ways. Praise God. Wonderful Lord. So we, had, we did have an amazing weekend. Uh, I think we probably won't do it again like that. Three, th three major things that happened to coincide into one one weekend, so next year we'll try to split them up around a little bit, and we'll do that really well. And uh, uh, oh yeah, Josiah is in prayer mode, praise God, he's on his knees, <coughs> hallelujah, and he's pouring the living water as he goes, hallelujah, and he's worshipping God with his hands, wonderful, <laughs> praise God, wonderful. Well, this morning we're going to continue around the, uh, the theme, you know, and anybody notice what the, what the theme is? For the, for the month? I heard two things, celebrate and cue the confetti. Cue the confetti. You know, if we had those things up here, those smoke machines, those blasts, we haven't got them, have we? No, we don't. I would have just said, do it, just bang. Praise God. You know, cueing the confetti. The confetti, there's a right time for the confetti, and it's connected to having a party, a celebration, a feast, call it what you like. God was into celebration in the Old Testament. He commanded. It wasn't a, a suggestion. It was a commandment that the people of God, they celebrated uh, for the feasts and uh, so on. So that's a whole story in itself. Today, uh, I'm not really going with that. I'm just going to go with the, the theme of what God's given us. Cue the confetti. And uh, I've titled my sermon title, Confetti Means Joy. And uh, if you ever, ever forget that you're going to go to a party and be a, a, you know, somebody sour, uh, then you need to rethink your, what you, where you're at and what your heart attitude's like, what you're thinking. I think, you know, the, I'm going to say it later on, but I want to preface it now. Word of God says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know, when you are joyful, you are strong in the spirit. You, it may not, you know, it's not necessarily physically or even mentally, could be mentally, but certainly in the spirit, you are strong. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And when you don't have joy, the opposite side of the same coin, um, there is no strength. On the other side, when you are joyful in the Lord, there is a strength that comes in inside of you that is unrelenting, doesn't let go, presses on to the miracles that God has. And I believe God has got some miracles for people today. That's what I felt he dropped in my spirit, and uh, it's going to be for the bold. You'll hear that as part of my message, but I felt that God was speaking to me in boldness. It's the bold that reach out in the moment, inopportune moments. Jesus experienced it right throughout his ministry, inopportune moments where people wanted, wanted a miracle, but it wasn't opportune. It wasn't right. They dropped a man in front of him from the roof. They opened up the roof. You know, he was doing a teaching session, but they, he was inopportune. They interrupted him. And uh, it wasn't culturally correct what they did, but somebody bold enough for faithful friends took their friend onto the roof and dropped him in front, as it were, of Jesus. You know, blind Bartimaeus, Jesus was actually going past, or some say he had gone past, and uh, he's crying out, Jesus, Son of God. He recognized who he was, even though other people didn't. The people that should have didn't, but he recognized, even as a blind man, he understood and he cried out. Inopportune moments, but a bold person launches in. And uh, you could, you know, today, you can be just a hearer of the word, that's fine. 
Uh, good to hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And as you hear the Word of God today, uh, it'll build faith in you. And uh, faith is the place where you can launch out in boldness. I believe there's steps to what we do. Hearing the Word is one thing, you know, and that's correct. It's not like it's wrong. Word of God says, let him, him who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So God will be speaking today through the message and, uh, and he will speak into your heart personally. And it may be very different for somebody on this side to somebody here to somebody there and somebody at the back and somebody, completely different things that he is able to do. I love this simultaneously because he knows your needs are very different to what actually, you know, somebody else beside you perhaps. And, you know, there can be two people seated side by side and one person gets it and another person doesn't. And I mean gets it, not only gets the word, but they get the miracle. You don't actually have to come to the front to be healed necessarily. You could be, but you don't have to be. I have been in many meetings where people have been healed just where they were as they, but in boldness, reached out and got a, you know, like the woman, uh, you know, with the issue of blood, she reached out through the crowd. It looks like she was on her hands and knees uh, it's because she got a hold of the hem of his garment or the tassel. It's believed it's a blue tassel uh, on the hem of his garment that she got a hold of, which was a a symbol of or spoke of the laws or the principles of God and she got a hold of the principle of God and she drew down power in an inopportune moment. He's on his way to do another miracle but she says, hey, before you get to that miracle, I'm gonna get my miracle. How about you? Are you just gonna watch other people get the miracles or are you gonna be the woman on your knees and say, I'm gonna get a hold of the Word of God? That, those tassels are the Word, the principles, the promises of God. Are you gonna get on your knees? You know, Sonny got on his knees before and uh, he was pretty close. He's gonna do it again today. He's gonna, to, I'm not sure what he's gonna do, but you know, that's the posture that she took, the woman with the issue of blood. She got down on her knees. She couldn't get through the crowd. So she gets down and presses through until she gets a hold of his garment. Now, I'm going to tell you, he's walking, so I reckon it created some tension on the garment. He wasn't just stationary saying, I'm waiting for someone to pull on the garment. He was on his way. He was walking, and she, I don't know how far she must have been going on her knees, but I saw some people here on Sunday night with plastic bags, and they were, they were going at full speed. Is that right, Janet? <laughs> Janet, I think you took the cake there. I think for effort, A plus one, uh, you really did. You excelled and uh, a number of people did. Uh, I saw Nicholas going at you know, triple the speed. He was just flying across the floor and uh, all that sort of thing. But, you know, I wonder how fast this woman was going because Jesus is walking and she's down on the ground somewhere in opportune moment, but boldness stepped out. You know, it's actually, Jesus, they said, Jesus said, somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. Wow. Wow. The disciples are a bit like, uh, what? You know, everybody's touching you. It's like the superstar. Can we touch you as you walk past? Everybody's touching you. He said, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. And he meant by faith, somebody drew down. I felt power going out of me. And he stopped. And he looked and he turned and he's watching to see. And in fear, she comes and admits, says, it was me, it was me, it was me. What a great confession. It's me, it's me. What about you, you know? Uh, all the rest may have wanted something too. I don't know what they were looking for, just to touch, you know, what he owned. Anybody ever touched something that was really famous or important? Anybody? Come on, somebody. Never, nobody's ever touched anything important? Wow. I'm, I'm shocked. Yes, Ben. One lonely hand in the crowd. What have you touched? Just in a few words. You accidentally touched the politician, but did you get the power coming down? You did. Precious Lord. Anybody shook hands with a famous person? Call it out. Oh, so Edmund Hillary, famous for, anybody know what he's famous for? Climbing Mount Everest, first man ever to climb Mount Everest that we know of. Yes, sir. John Howard, yep. Anybody shook the hand of John Howard? 
Yep, number of, I've shook the hand of most prime ministers in my lifetime, but not all of them, you know. But anyway, uh, that didn't change my life, let me tell you. It's just interesting to do. Think, well, that's great. But Baza. Oh, you met Reinhard Bonnke. You shook his hand. Oh, no, he, you prayed with him at the altar. He, didn't, he wasn't getting prayed for. He was praying with Reinhard Bonnke for people. He's gone above and beyond the rest. Baza. Praise God. Wonderful. Hallelujah. You know, famous things are famous things and uh, so on. Anybody, anybody old enough, and the young people, you can forget this question. Anybody old enough to remember the days of the Beatles? Just a few people. Anybody remember in the same days there was the monkeys? Anybody remember the, the show, TV show, the monkeys? Anybody remember the monkey mobile? Yeah? Well, the monkey mobile came to Mariba, and I laid hands on it as a probably five or six year old. And I remember stealing a little tiny metal piece of it. And I had my memorabilia. I've got it. The monkey mobile. And it turned out to be a nothing mobile for me. In the, <laughs> when I got saved, all things are finished and you know, passed. That was a famous little machine, the monkey mobile. Did a tour of the world, did a tour of Australia, but it didn't change my life. What changes your life is when you touch Jesus. You know, you can make, shake the hands of prime ministers and you can meet the queen and so on and so on. But you, there, are, there is nothing that will compare with touching Jesus even through this sermon. Praise God. Wonderful Jesus. You know, uh, what rhymes with, with uh, spaghetti? Hey, we've got a people here. Come on, make her the bolognese, please. Bring her the cheese. Make it good. You know, confetti is used in weddings during the bridal waltz and on, on the reception departure. I know at our wedding, Fitra and I, uh, they sprinkled us with confetti as we were having our first bridal dance. And when we were leaving, you know, they did the tunnel of love and arms up and we're going through and all that and they're sprinkling stuff everywhere. It takes you days to get rid of it all, especially in my thick curly hair that I had in those days, you know, and so on. But it's, it's, it's something that emerged out of, where, what country do you think it came from? A spaghetti, think of spaghetti, think of confetti. Where did it come from? The Italian, it's Italian. English word for confetti denotes Jordan almonds. So the almonds, they're usually sugar-coated ones, you know, the white ones. It actually started somewhere there from the Italian confectionery of the same name, which was small, sweet, traditionally thrown during carnivals, not necessarily weddings. And the Italian word for paper confetti, I'm not even sure I can pronounce it, Lord, coriandoli, coriandoli. Does that sound like anybody Italian can help me? No Italians in the house, shame. Bellissimo. Okay, well, that's not the word, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> A couple of days. Confetti is always associated with celebration. I think it is. There's always a right time for everything in life, including celebration. You don't celebrate every single moment in the way that we talk of celebration, but there is a right time to celebrate. And the book of Ecclesiastes makes it quite clear. There's a time to laugh, time to cry, time to be born, time to die, time to plant, time to uproot, time to build, time to tear down, and so on and so on. So there is a right time for everything under the sun. Praise God. You know, do you remember anybody old enough to remember in the mid-90s? So if you're 25 and under, you won't remember this unless you happen to have seen the footage. Anybody remember the, the, the moment when, Australia, when they were going to announce who was going to host the Olympic Games? No, no. Do you remember is the question. I didn't ask you where, we, where it went. Anybody remember the moment, the footage? Oh, just one... You weren't, yeah, you might have been born, but you wouldn't remember. Maybe. Yeah, that's may, it may not help, though. Uh, the, the Chinese had put a bid in for the Olympic Games, and they were so confident the whole way through from launching their bid until the night of the announcement, and the Chinese team was there on Adam on footage and the Australian team, and, and the, as soon as they said it, and the winner is, and the guy had a bit of an accent, Sydney, anybody remember Sydney? And the Chinese just erupted with praise. Did anybody remember that? 
Chinese were so confident they, could, they would get it, they cued the confetti too early. That's my terms. And shouted in excitement only to realise they lost the bid to Australia just seconds later. They hadn't waited to listen before they cued their confetti. Their confetti was jumping into the air and screaming with all of their might that Beijing had the Olympic Games to be hosted. So make sure that you cue the confetti exactly right in life. Praise God. Okay, we're going to come to, for those that are diligent uh, students of the Word of God, remember last week, uh, for those that were present, I said, I will be a student all of my life. I'm not, I'm not the teacher. I am a teacher, but I'm not the teacher. I am a teacher, but I'm also a student. I keep learning. So for the students today that are studious in this approach, write down some points. We have, I, have, I have obediently complied to three points, and you, you, can, you can follow three points. And uh, we have one major portion of Scripture today, and we'll break that down in the best way we can so you can learn how to celebrate and how to actually enter in and take a hold of a miracle at an inopportune moment when it doesn't suit other people. So my first point, I've called it, you are invited to the party. You know, I could have went so many directions on that, but I say it's sufficient to say, if you're born again, you're invited to the party, the wedding feast of the bride and the bridegroom. That's not too far away. If ever there was a closeness in history, it's fairly close. I believe it's very close. And uh, whatever you think on that, you can think on that, but it's very close. And if you're born again, you're invited to the celebration party. It's going to be an incredible party. And uh, maybe one day I'd love to revisit the whole picture of Scripture where the ten virgins, the five foolish, the five wise, and the Hebrew culture behind that right from the very beginning of the betrothal right through to the end when the bridegroom comes and the celebration begins and when the door is shut and the room I prepared in my father's house and so on and so on. There is such a beautiful picture, but today is not the day for that. Sufficient to say that in John chapter 2, verse 1 to 12 is the portion of Scripture, the main portion today, it's where Jesus turned the water into wine. It's a famous portion. Uh, the jo Gospel of John, as far as I can see and look at and know, is the only gospel that records turning the water into wine. The others didn't deem it necessary or important or they weren't inspired to record that particular event. Nevertheless, it's been spoken about repeatedly. It's the beginning of miracles. It's the first miracle Jesus ever did. He didn't do other miracles prior to that. This is the first one that showed his glory. And we'll see that in due course. So on the third day, now I want to stop. I'm going to make comments along the journey here. On the third day, which in Hebrew culture is Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And some say it's, it was a one-day wedding and some others say it was the third day of the wedding. Uh, because some wedding feasts went for a week. It all depended on whether you were rich or poor, whether you had the capacity to do a week-long festivity like that. You know what it costs to do one night. Most people understand one night. Well, this was seven days and seven nights. So I reckon you could easily be looking at, for a crowd of three or 400 people, $100,000 for a week of non-stop festivities. So if you didn't have 100,000, you only had 5,000, you may only have one particular meal and so on. But it doesn't give us more detail. So on the third day, the third day is also, hold that thought, it's the third day Jesus rose from the dead. Three days later, three days and three nights, I'll be in the belly of the earth as, who was? In the, Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Praise God. So there's a th th something about the third day that perhaps uh, references there. There was a wedding in the Cana of Galilee, and uh, it's noted the mother of Jesus was there. It doesn't say Mary, it makes because there's many Marys, so now we need to know which one it is. It's the mother of Jesus is present at the wedding. So she was invited to the wedding. Verse 2, now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So now we have Mary, mother of Jesus, Jesus and his disciples, and it's likely that there were many other people, but they happen to be noted because they are important in this whole story to know why the story went the way that it did. 
And so they were invited to the party. It's point number one, you are invited. You got that? So you need to get thinking, am I going to be ready for the celebration? For the celebration in Scripture, you need to be dressed in the right robes. This is not the Scripture, but there's one certain portion of Scripture I was reading it this morning, and it says that you need to be dressed correctly. You can't be dressed without wedding clothes. There are particular uh, approach to this. And for us, it's to know that you've got a garment. It's white and it's pure and it's clean and it's holy and it's without spot, without blemish and without wrinkle. Three things, spot, blemish or wrinkle. You know, a spot means dirt, you know. Spot, blemish. Blemish is a like a, a stain. It's been washed out, but there's still a mark there, a blemish. Something marked that's not easily removed. Or a wrinkle, wrinkle is where you can hide the spot or the blemish. So it's ironed out and it's clean. In other words, live holy. Can you be holy in your own strength? No, you can't. You can be holy in God's strength. And it's God imparts and imputes is a word that Scripture uses, holiness, by the fact and the virtue that God, you know, only God, because I couldn't authorize this and neither could you, God chose that when you receive Jesus and you're washed in the blood and your sins are washed away in the blood of the Lamb, that uh, He said, I choose to fill you with my Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can't live and dwell in dirt and filth and sin and ugliness. He won't do it. But it's because He washed us in the blood that He made us righteous to receive the Holy Spirit. And it's the presence of God in your life that will make you holy. And you need to be conscious, and I need to be conscious of the fact that the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I am not just a earthen vessel full of treasure that means like diamonds and gold and silver. Far beyond diamonds, gold and silver is the treasure of the Holy Spirit, far worth far more than anything you could ever imagine. God said, I put treasure in earthen vessels. So I'm made pure and holy and righteous because of the deposit of the Holy Spirit. And, be, and He won't come unless I'm cleansed. And uh, if you're not today born again by the Spirit of God, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the service to be born again, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life because if you are not, you're going to a lost eternity and that is the place that the Scripture describes as hell. And hell is a place, the Word of God says, that it's not the will of God. Listen to this. It's not the will of God. It is not God's will that any should perish and go to hell. He said it's His will that every man, every woman, every child comes to the to salvation and the knowledge of Christ so that He prepared a place for everyone. It's not too much for God to have a place prepared for everyone. Hell is not your destiny. Hell is not what you were born for. You are destined by God to be saved and go to glory. That's what you are destined for. And you've got to, you have a part to play. He does what he does, and he does it incredibly well. He does it so well that we could never do what he does. But you have a responsibility to reciprocate. And to reciprocate means to hear him and obey him. I love you so much, I want to do it. You know, Jesus said, do not be hearers only, but be doers of the word. You know, what we're doing here today, one of the things we're doing is we're in fellowship today. And we've come because the Word tells us Jesus actually had fellowship. He had not just fellowship. He went to the synagogue on a regular basis. He had fellowship with a broader group of people. That's what we're doing today. They came for corporate praise. They came for corporate worship. They sat under the reading of the Word and the preaching or the ministering of the Word. And they did that. Jesus did that. And then the Word of God also implores us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't Leave it aside as something that's uh, optional, extra, like you're buying a car. I'll have a radio, CD, and electric aerial, but I won't have the stripes on the side. This is not optional to Christian living. We need fellowship. We need one another. And especially in these last days, he said, more so as you see that day, the final day approaching. As you see that final day, and you know, a lot of people are seeing today for the first time perhaps in our modern history, that day approaching. A survey recently said that more people are now reading the Bible since COVID-19 began than ever in the surveys ever done. 
people that are not churchgoers or people that were churchgoers or backsliders, but non-church people have got their Bibles out because the survey says that more people are reading the Word. They're looking for answers. They're seeing the world that we knew come apart. It's possible that the world we knew may never be the same again. It's possible that this may get worse rather than better. It may get better, but it could get worse. Are we ready for whatever is coming? So thank God that people are going back to the Word to find answers in the Bible. Hallelujah. Man, we could preach on too much of this today, Baza. Plenty there to go on. So first of all, you're invited to the wedding party. You're invited to the party. Number two, you are not invited to be a soursop, you know. You're not invited to be like a Christian baptized in lemon juice. I'm coming to the party. But you you ever been to parties where there's somebody has got some gripe about somebody else there? They're going around like the other son, the older son that Fitrit preached on a few weeks ago. They're going around like... So you killed the fatted calf. Did you? Oh, we're having a party. That's great. How come it's never happened for me? What, what are you doing it for him? Spend all his money on drinking and prostitutes. Great, Dad. Have you ever had somebody at your party? You know, mostly everybody, if you're living, feel if you've got a pulse. If you've been to a party, you've probably seen somebody like that. There's always somebody like that. <laughs> they, they seem to be just got to be there. You know, just the, what, what's the word? Were those that spoil parties? What do we call them? Yeah, maybe. There's another word I'm thinking of, but it doesn't matter. They're there to wreck the joy. They don't want anybody else to have fun either. Wet blanket. <laughs> uh, you know, when you are having a party, Everybody should be joyful. So point two, you are invited to be joyful, happy, happy. Bring the joy. Don't come there trying to find the joy. Bring the joy. You know, when you come to church, you know, think along those lines. Am I going to walk in like I need help or am I going to walk in like I can give help? Because I don't want to be the person looking like everybody's saying, are you Are you all right? And if I'm not, it's okay, because there's always somebody that's not all right, but let's be the majority that we're all right because we're in Him, and we can help those that are not all right. I'm not saying pretend when you're not all right, but let's not be, you know, some people are like systematically consistent in everything they do, they just sour all the time, you know? I call them grumpy. They're grumpy, they're sad, they're miserable, they drain on you. You know, some people, if you know, you'll know what I'm saying. There are some people within less than a few minutes, you'll feel the energy draining out of you. You know those sort of people? They do exist and they come to church as well. And somehow we've got to convert them from being the drainers to the fillers. You know, I think we've all been the drainers. We've all probably been there, done that. But we've got to be people that are the ones who are giving joy. You know, joy is a contagious thing. You know, I know the scripture says this, and uh, it says simple, it's really simple, you know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Is that right? And you sort of can look at that and say, oh yeah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But something actually happens on the inside. Something happens in your brain, Ben. We're talking about brain. Something happens in the brain. There's all kinds of areas are activated when you get laughing and happy. All kinds of What? Endorphins are released through your body. Even other hormones are activated and you change from being the sour looking person and it changes something physically. A merry heart does good. A merry, a happy heart, joyful heart does good. Not bad, not sickness. A merry heart does good like A medicine. So medicines are there to do you good, for sure. You go and do what you got to do medically. But God says a merry, joyful, happy heart does good like a medicine. You don't even need to take it. You don't need to go and buy it. You don't have to go to the chemist. You don't need instructions and prescriptions. God just saying if you will just allow yourself some liberty of joy, it'll bring healing to your body. 
I think that God's speaking to a few people here this morning. I just felt the little nudge. When he does that little nudge thing, I just felt the little nudge. He said, I'm talking to people. And uh, if you get this today, I'm going to tell you, it doesn't have to be just in the service. It's how you live. You know, what atmosphere goes around your life? What bubble follows you when you walk into your house? What bubble follows you when you walk, you know, into your bedroom, married couples? What bubble follows you into your business and workplace? When you go to your workplace, do you just turn up and just like serious, serious all day long? I'm just going to get my job done. When the five o'clock comes, I'm going home. You know, like nobody feels like they really want to be around you. Jesus was attractive. If you've never seen the pictures or drawings of the laughing Jesus, you should. It's really inspiring. You know why children ran to Jesus and not to the disciples? Because the disciples had yet to be converted into what I am just speaking about. They were not the happy chappies. See, the culture of that day isn't a lot different to the culture of a lot of other cultures in the world. You know, children are meant to be, what? Seen and not heard. They're meant to be in the background. They are non-entities. They have no authority because they're beyond the years of authority. They have no power or influence. So stay in the shadows and don't interrupt the adults because we're more important than you. That's the message children get from adults on a constant and regular basis. And it happens to be in other cultures. When we grew up in the Albanian Muslim culture, we were in the background. And, you know, I know as little kids, we laughed a lot, you know. And adults, the serious adults would be in the formal lounge and they'd be in there and my my mum would be serving, you know, Turkish coffee and whatever, whiskey or brandy or something for the men and cigarettes were crossing the room and all that stuff. And, and, uh, And as kids, sometimes we just get what we call the giggles. Anybody, not the Biggles, Biggles was an old time story on the radio. Anybody remember Biggles? There's three people, only four people. Okay, not Biggles, Giggles. We would get the Giggles and we just would stop. <laughs> and we'd dash off down the corridor trying to make it quiet, but we just couldn't stop. And we get into a lot of trouble over giggling because the culture didn't invite children into the room to, in, to listen to the conversation of older people, that's how you learn. That's how children will learn wisdom by sitting in the sound of, the hearing of wise adults. You know, there are topics obviously that they shouldn't be there for, but most times we should. Jesus, they ran to Jesus. You know why? They saw, in a crowd, they saw a laughing Jesus. Jesus smiling and looking at them with loving eyes and they were running to him. And they were trying to chase him off, get away from him. He's too important for you. He said, let them come. Don't stop the children. And he said, I'm going to bless them. I don't know what he did to bless them, but I reckon he laid hands on their heads and he said, I bless this one. This one will be a preacher. This one will be singing. This one will write new songs for the kingdom. This one will do this. And this one will raise up businesses to fund the kingdom. Who knows what he prayed over those little kids that after his ascension to glory, they rose up and became what he preached and prayed over them. But the rest didn't want the kids. So you're invited to be joyful, point two. When they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. You know, have you run out of joy? Because wine speaks of joy. That's the symbolism of wine in the scripture. Have you run out of joy? Have you? Ask yourself, I'm not here to answer the question, I'm here to pose the question, so you can answer yourself. Have you run out of joy? Not water, not wine, but joy. You know, Mary, uh, this is what I felt that God, this is what he put in my heart. Mary is cueing a miracle. This is not meant to happen in this environment, at this season, at this time. And uh, she's asking, she's made an observation, they have no wine. She's cueing a miracle. It's like getting ready to cue the confetti. Because there's going to be, if this happens, there's going to be a celebration. She's got something on her mind. Have you ever been to an, to an event where the food ran out? 
you know, especially those where you line up on both sides and you get your plate and you fill it up and you, but the last 20 out of 200 are sort of just looking at each other across the table and seeing only empty, empty vessels there with no food. Anybody ever been to an event like that? I have, you know? What did you do? Did you get angry? Did you get upset? Did you feel rejected? Did you feel like they don't really love me after all? Come on, let's be honest. What did you feel, Jean? Shame. Yeah, well, it's a shame. It can happen. Look, it does happen, and we're none of us are perfect, and people calculate. And then again, I can tell you what happens that sometimes the first bunch going through, they load their plates like for 50 people, and you wonder why the last ones didn't get any. That's called what? Greed. <laughs> we'll leave that there. So it's an embarrassment when you run out of food or drink at a wedding, and I have seen it. You know, in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 10, it says, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, why would he say do not sorrow? I think there were people that had reason to sorrow. They may be mourning. They may be in grief. They could have sick relatives who are about to die. But he says, hey, today is holy. Choose today to be joyful. Make it a choice because you are the influencer of the atmosphere. Let's start with your house. That's, um, when I say house, I mean this house. You influence who you are by the level of joy around this house. You have got a house. Your physical body is the house of the Holy Spirit. You choose what, how you are gonna be. You're gonna be, a, look, I believe God commands to be joyful. That means it's possible to make a choice. It's possible to say, okay, I've got some problems, but I choose. You know, one of the best ways I'd, I'd say to do this, I choose to start worshiping and praising God. You start to break, you know, put on the garments of praise. Who remembers the old song? Put on the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up the voice now still. Sing unto God, what? With what? Can't hear you. Shout of triumph, yeah. You know, when we begin to shout triumphantly, Shout with praise. You know when you're down and miserable, you're just generally really low in the dumps and your voice ex says that? You know, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Mm. Yeah, uh, is there any? Uh, and nobody's coming around, you know, because you're miserable. Nobody wants to be around miserable people. Choose to be happy. I'm gonna put aside my problems, my trials, my disasters. Some of them, Look, some things that are disastrous in our lives are our own fault. Sometimes they're the fault of other people. You like that? No, you don't like that. Because you've got to look in the mirror. How many times have you created your own problems? I can say that because of moi. I know the times if I could wind the clock back and say, man, if I could re-choose what I just did back there, I would do that many, many times. I would go back so far back in my life, I'd be in my mother's womb. That's how many times I think I've made a mistake. And I, but you can't change what you did. You've got to accept what you did and take joy in God. You know, that's why God says, I will rebuild the old ruins and the waste places. God says, okay, you made a mess. Waste places, ruins, I'm the, build, I'm the one who who will rebuild those waste places. I'll, re, I'll build up the old cities that have been laid level. People will live again. Uh, the, the vineyards will grow again. There'll be vines in the field and there'll be wheat and there'll be sheep and there'll be cattle where there's nothing. So you've got to change the atmosphere around your house. Then you change the atmosphere in your house where your spouse and your children live and maybe some might have parents living with you or family or f friends or whoever they may be, but you must choose to change the atmosphere of your house. You know, when you come to church, you either bring that atmosphere of joy or you bring the atmosphere of heaviness. 
get rid of the heaviness and begin to say, I'm going to start again. And maybe it's more time to seek God than I've ever sought God before because I haven't sought God so much before and I just did what I did without God being involved too much. But I'm now going to involve God because I recognise that left to my own devices, I've made a bit of a mess. And God isn't condemning you for the mess because the mess is everywhere for everybody in some way or another, we have all failed God in various ways. But are you capable of restarting the journey? That's the key question. Hallelujah. So verse four, continuing on, Jesus said to a woman, and he doesn't even say Mary or mum, mum would be more appropriate, but he distances himself because he's now talking from the perspective of the person, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who will be the Redeemer, the one who will be Saviour. And he says, woman, what does your concern Emphasis, your concern, you are concerned. What does your concern have to do with me? I'm attending as a guest. It's not my responsibility to fix everybody's problems. Is that reasonable? I think it's reasonable. If I go to a wedding and there's not enough food, I'm more than likely just to say, that's fine. I'll take a seat and if I have to miss out, I'm fine. You know why? Because I know that I won't die before the morning. I've got enough reserves to keep me going for a little while, and most of us have. So if I miss out, hey, I couldn't celebrate like the way we wanted to with the food. So what has this got to do with you? Your concern is your concern, but you're trying to make your concern my concern. And he says something profound. My hour has not yet come. And he was defining something really powerful. He was saying, I know who I am. I know what I'm here for on earth. I know what I'm gonna do. I have, I'm not in doubt of who I am and what I'm gonna do, but I will determine the starting point and this is not the starting point. I think that's an amazing statement. My hour has not yet come. This is not the right time, woman. I've made my, my thinking this morning was along these lines. I made a note this morning on this. I said, miracles are for the bold. Miracles can happen here today before you exit that door. But it is not for the timid. The timid means that, well, you know, if it comes my way, if the pastor has a word of knowledge, I had one, one guy that I know, is out of fellowship now, unfortunately uh, for him, uh, he had this attitude all the time. Well, I'll only go out, you know, if the preacher nails it exactly, even then points to me and says, come out. And you know, that can happen. But when you are doing that from your perspective, you're telling God how God's gonna move. And yet this particular person, you know, whether all those other people I mentioned, but even Mary here, Mary is doing something boldly that, you know, in the natural you couldn't and shouldn't do. But I know those moments in my own life when God begins to stir me up, it's almost like my insides begin to shake and I feel the presence of God. I feel like I've got to say this. I've got to do something. And often it works out quite incredibly well and uh, that's exactly where God was moving. And uh, it, whether Jesus wanted to hold that moment, whether whatever it was, but Mary sensed something. I reckon she felt it deep inside. I don't think she was wrong. I don't believe she was presumptuous. I believe she, she was hearing the Spirit of God urging her, moving her. So she says what she says. Joy, you know, I've never really seen miserable people get miracles. I hope you can hear that. People that may be in suffering, may be in pain or sickness, there's something about, see, for me personally, I've had a number of occasions where God had to remind me uh, quite wonderfully and well, I wasn't resisting it, but he said, it's the spirit of a man that sustains him. Not your intellect, not your physical body, you know, not your education, not your degrees, not, none of those things, your social status, there's lots and lots of things he said, but when you are going through the deepest, deepest trials in your life, it's the spirit of a man that sustains him. How healthy is your spirit? 
So that you can be sick in the house. You can have diseases of any number in your body. I don't know what you've got. If he tells me, that's great. But what if he doesn't? Your spirit, if you look after your spiritual man, you feed on the Word of God. You get to fellowship. You study the Scriptures. You, you are doing the things that keep you alive and keep you well and healthy in your spirit. You can be in pain and still reaching out to God in boldness to say, today is my day of deliverance and I'm, I'm going to get a hold of... You know, that woman with the issue of blood, do you think that she may have been in pain? I tend to think she has been in pain for 12 years, not just an issue, but she had pain and she's still on her knees. I don't know what grimacing was in her face, but her faith was saying, I've got to get to the hem of his garment. I've got to get my miracle. She was bolder than everybody there. And boldness is one of the fruits, I use the word fruits, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can be filled with the Spirit of God. And when you are filled, I can tell you one of the things that did for my life, like immediately there was a boldness there that changed my whole nature, persona, my communication, my authority level shifted. Boldness came into my life and has never left me, never, never, ever, ever failed me. Same for you. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit and you to speak in tongues and use those tongues every day, they're not like a, oh, I got saved 40 years ago, spoke in tongues, but I haven't done anything since. No, no, no. Faith and boldness come through the baptism of the Spirit in an amazing way. It's like multiply by a hundred. Wonderful Lord. So joy, passion for God will come through your life towards God in every way. So he says that to his mother, and in verse five, his mother said to the, she didn't say anything about, my hour has not yet come. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jesus. I didn't realize that your hour hadn't come. I just made a big mistake. I shouldn't have preempted, I shouldn't have been presumptuous. Will you forgive me? She doesn't even comment, because if she comments, she's gotta say something in the form of agreement because there is nothing more to say. He's the son of God. And she knew that. She knew how he was conceived. A virgin birth, the prophecies over his life. She knew who she's talking to. It's her son, but her son is an amazing person. But she doesn't dare confront him on that. She just says to the, she turns from Jesus to the servants. Whatever he says to you, do it. The word is Obedience. You know, to obey is better than sacrifice. Sacrifice, you can sacrifice. You can, you know, in the scheme of things, people sacrifice animals every day. Today, thousands of animals will be sacrificed for the sins of people. Different religions and beliefs will make sure of that. But, you know, for us, the Word of God says that he was crucified once and for all. He shed his blood once and for all. Not going to do it again and again and again, just once and for all. And, uh, you know, the one thing that we can give him back is obedience. Because you can be disobedient. You can live in the world. I'm a Christian, but I can live in the world. I can dance with the world. I can sing with the world. But obedience says, you know, you're a holy temple. Obedience says, I, I, can, I can be in the world, but I'm not of the world. I love Jesus more than I love anything in this world. And so on. I could say, keep, keep going on with that. But whatever he says to you, do it. You know, and I believe as Christians, we're not under a law or the law, but we can learn obedience as disciplined children. Whatever he says in his, how would you know what he says? You've got to read the word. Get the word inside of you so that when the tempter comes, I mean, Jesus was tempted with the word of God. The things that the devil came and tempted him with on the three occasions, all those things are found as scriptures in the Old Testament. So Satan will come to you with the Word of God. And unless you know the Word of God, not just know the Word of God, but know the Spirit of the Word, jump, for it is written, the angels of God will bear you up. Oh, that's one, yeah, you can take scripture out of context, that's what false religions do, cults do that, but... Jesus said, ah, oh, yeah, but it's written. It's also written. This is the spirit of the world. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. 
Oh, turn these stones into bread. That's in the Old Testament. And he says, oh, yeah, that, that's even possible. That's the inference of Scripture. It's, yeah, that could happen, but I want to tell you something higher. Every time Jesus answered, he answered higher. Higher by the Spirit, higher by the Word. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. And that's not just what's written, but also what he speaks into your spirit. Jesus was hearing the Father speak by the Spirit how he could overcome the devil giving him Scripture. So unless you get Scripture, read the Word, memorise the Word, teach the Word to your wife, your husband or your children, and, you know, and circles are coming, so opportunities for teaching and get, getting the Word into people, especially around your own home. Wow. His mother said, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, there were set, I underline the word set, there were set, in the, set means in the right place in the house. There were set, you know, are you set? Are you set? Are you set in the right place in this house? That's a bit of a twist on things, isn't it? The water jars, in one way, many ways, speak of people. And then a set place. See, God has a place. I know Fitra's got a saying. What is the saying? There's a place for everyone. Everyone. There's a place for everyone that comes in those doors to be in this house. There is a place for everyone, but everyone in their place. Everyone has a set position in this house should you embrace it. So you can be an attender, an attendee of church, Royal's Church, or you can be set in the house. Are you set or are you just observing? Are you just attending? Because a set person, I believe this, the only way you know if you're set, you actually have a function. You catch that? Should, someone should write that on the neck of the person in front of them in case you forget. That's what Pastor John Lewis used to say, passed away recently. He said, that, I'm going to say something so profound, write it on the neck of the person in front of you. It's too serious for me. Somebody should be laughing, my goodness me. It's a bit too much. Too much. Now that we're set, there are six water pots of stone. You know, six, as many references in Scripture, we're so familiar with 666 and the mark of the beast. It's also six days thou shalt work and on the seventh you shall rest. You know, it may have something to do with the aspect of the fallen nature of man. It is actually six in numerical uh, terms, speaks of sinful man and so on. According to the manner of purification of the Jews. So they had the water pots there for a purpose, the purification. Lots of people are going to be there and lots of people are going to use the water for purification. So it's a preparation, not only for the family, but it's also for the attendees of the wedding. They contain 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Now, I was, I was raised up on gallons. I know what imperial gallons are. I know what US gallons are. And I'm just going to help everybody who's not raised up in that era of time. It's about 20 to 30 gallons, about 100 litres each. Six of those is 600 litres in total. And that, my friends, works out to be more than half a tonne of water. If they were empty. We don't know. The scripture doesn't say they were almost empty. They were empty. They were half full. But if they were empty, they would need... 600 litres approximately to fill them up or half a tonne of water. And I began to think about how I think, oh yeah, they just got the little bucket and tipped it in, tipped it in, and it was full. I just see the servants and I don't know who else joined them, maybe the disciples. They went and filled them. They, you know, in those days, there was a well in the, in the towns and it wasn't necessarily outside your front door. It may have been a kilometer or two or three or four. And even if there were 20 men that went with large containers, you'd, have, you'd be tired. I reckon it's hard, sweaty work carrying that kind of weight. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? 
You know, I don't know what weights you've ever carried, but I've carried some really heavy weights in my life and so on. Won't go into all of that. And we had to get so fit, otherwise you would never make it. And we had to get super fit, and we were super fit. Uh, that would be the way I'd like to be today. But, you know, we can always reminisce and think about and ponder on those things. But I was super fit in seasons of my life. And it uh, didn't seem like anything was a problem. You know, anything was okay. And uh, we learned to carry heavy weights. These people had to carry a lot of water. You know, up to the max, maybe a total of 600 litres, half a tonne of water. And Jesus now responds to the actions See, somebody has to do something for Jesus to move. And faith without works is dead. Faith without action from somebody. See, Mary spoke the words of faith and her words went out and did not return to her empty and void. She pushed through to set the scene for cue the confetti. There's going to be celebration because of my words at this particular venue. Are you cueing anything in your life? Are you preparing something in the spirit for cueing the confetti in your life? See, you may have had tragedy. You may have had disaster. You might have had deaths. You may have had bankruptcies. You may have had financial businesses go down the gurgler. You may have lost loved ones. There may be serious sickness. Many, many broken relationships that really, you just need God. But how do you cue the confetti? Well, Mary, she knew how to cue the confetti. She had something to say. They've run out of wine. It's an observation. What's that got to do with me? Your concerns, what are they to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Why are you bothering me? She doesn't look at him, she looks at them and says, whatever, anything he tells you. He could have said, sit down, and they would have sat down. She said, whatever he tells you. She, she actually was sensing the anointing and the miracle working power that was going to be released, but it needed somebody to speak and somebody to move before he moved. You catch the sequence of events. Somebody spoke, somebody did, and then he moved. Mm. fill the water pots with water first commandment this is what's coming out of his mouth it's a commandment fill them fill the water pots with water they may have been empty we don't know if they were but they may have been completely empty why? because a lot of people at the wedding at the right time of the day they would be ceremonially washing and it's all gone and there's hundreds of people around and so on connected this is connected to the law of Moses this is what you did if you were following Moses' law. And they, the Word of God says, and they filled them up to the brim. So when he said fill, obedience means to fill. Precious Lord. In other words, put in. So get the water and put it into the stone vessels. And he said to them, second, second commandment. First he said, Fill the water pots with water. And then he said to them, second commandment, draw some out now, first part A, and second part, and take it to the master of the feast. First was pour in, now take out, and take it to the master of the feast. Master of the feast, because Jesus worked always in the view of life, with recognized authority. The master of the feast had the authority over the wedding. He's the MC. He's the guy that's actually running the show, giving guidance, direction, bring more food. Oh, it's gonna be time for an item. It's gonna be some music, gonna be a dance, whatever. He was in charge. So Jesus said, draw some out and take it to him. And he said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. They obeyed in getting the water and filling to the brim. Have you ever, last night I filled Fitrit's glass and I just looked away for a second because Baza distracted me. I have to blame somebody. And when I looked back, it was filled to the brim, but it didn't overflow, but it had anybody who knows a little bit of scientific knowledge or words, it had a meniscus. You know what a meniscus is? That's when it's higher than the edges of the glass. There's more water in the glass than the glass can hold, but it hasn't flowed over. And she had a meniscus glass of water. 
And you know what you do with a meniscus glass of water? You've got to lean forward and slurp. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to spill. You can't move that glass. The meniscus was proud. And Barry's eyes popped open and he was looking at it like, what? You, you overfilled it. <laughs> no, I filled it to the brim. I was prophesying about this morning's message, Barry. Only thing, I didn't know it. Now I know what it was doing last night. I filled it to the brim. Praise God. So they took it out. Obedience, draw it, two things, draw out and take it. I look at key words in Scripture to learn principles. Pre key things. They took it out, draw it out and take it. Cue the confetti. <laughs> Something, I mean, there's going to be joy in the house because this is a mis this is gonna this is about to become a miserable place there's no more to drink not water not wine not anything it's all over and somewhere somebody cued the confetti I think it was Mary cued the confetti but then everybody else had a part to play point three you're invited to release the confetti you know when miracles happen it's time to shout and get excited and tell the whole world about it. So many people in scripture that Jesus did a miracle for, he said, don't go and tell anybody because it's gonna stop me ministering. The people are gonna you know, crowd me and I won't be able to move. And it happened exactly as he said. They couldn't help themselves. They went and told the whole known world around their world, guess what? A guy that I just met up the road, he opened my eyes. And I, I was a demoniac amongst the graves and shouting, screaming and cutting myself for years and now I'm free, free, I'm free. You know, they, and the whole towns would come out to see Jesus. So when the master of the feast had, first thing he did was tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water, they knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom. So two things the master of the feast did. First, what was the first thing he did? He tasted I mean, that's really important. If, if it's any good, you need to know. Before you say everybody can drink, what if it's poison? What if it's, you know, someone's trying to try to kill the entire wedding party? He said, I'll taste. And then he said, he called the bridegroom. He tasted. He didn't tell anybody else. He called the bridegroom. I want to talk to you. Go and get him. Bring the bridegroom to me. I want to tell you that in my thinking around this topic today, I know in Exodus 7, uh, 7, 17 to 21 is a portion of Scripture. I'm not going to read it. It just simply is the place where Moses turned the water into blood. You know, blood speaks of death. But in John chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, brought death, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so when we look at this type of topic, you know there's a parallel from old into new. Old says quite clearly, water turned into blood and everything died. It, that's what it tells you. Everything that was in the river died. Everything, fish swam, you know, came floating to the top. Everything died, they couldn't live. But in the New Testament, he turns the same kind of water into wine. Something that speaks of life, refreshing, joy and power. And he said, that's the master of ceremonies, said to him, to the bridegroom, every man at the beginning sets out good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, the rubbish comes out last. When you, you know, you give the best you've got, but if it's looked like you're running out, you'll bring out the reserves of rubbish. It's, I'm surprised you have kept the good wine until now. But he didn't know that he hadn't kept the good wine until now. He'd run out completely of good and bad and ugly. Somebody cued the confetti. Somebody saved the man the embarrassment. Somebody came with a message of deliverance. You know, there's a deliverance in what happened that day. It was a miracle. It was a deliverance. You know, these people possibly would have been the poorer of the Hebrew people of the day. They didn't have enough or perhaps all they could budget or perhaps they underestimated. I don't know what, we're not given the real cause, we're just given a story that they were undersupplied. So you're invited to release the confetti because the miracle has happened. 
There's a place for you to rejoice and be glad. And I don't know what you're thinking right now, but God is actually reading you today. You know, if God was to be ministering to you all that you require in life, what is the greatest need of your life? What is the place where you would like something to happen? You need a Mary situation where somebody sees the need. You need servants who are obedient. Words and actions produce the miracle. Somewhere there's some sort of format of how things unfolded. They didn't just actually happen. Jesus could easily have left that wedding feast saying, yep, they didn't plan it really well. Don't worry. Tomorrow's another day. But actually, he didn't leave the wedding feast like that. And neither did he repeat, my hour has not yet come. He just did what the opportunity came. And you have today, I believe, heard a message that sets you up for a miracle. I make it plain and clear, I'm not the miracle maker nor the miracle giver. I serve him as you do. But the principles that are laid out in that little portion of Scripture sets you up for a miracle in your life, which says no regrets on anything. When you actually have faith in God for miracles, you're set up from God. You are set up from God for a miracle today. See, a person who looks back, that's why the Scripture says, you know, don't look back like the man that's plowing his field. I know what happens when you look back because I was that man until I learned not to do it. And if you look back, you will inevitably, by the time you turn around, no matter how straight your rows are, in the moment you look back, you'll put a kink in the rows. And farmers take pride in really good straight rows. And you learn not to look back. But if you are looking back and you're living your life with regret, you're not ready for a miracle. You've got to stop looking back and start looking forward. And somewhere in you, in your mouth, maybe it's your mouth, your words, have got to start speaking life over your circumstances and then got to start to pick up one foot and put it before the other and start moving towards the stone jar, empty water pots and see them filled with the water which turns into wine. You know, your part today, some of you perhaps are in this particular uh, setting. You are a, like a stone water jar, means an earthen vessel. And you may be quite empty. You may never have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't, today's a great day to be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, filled, 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 but not just filled, but filled to the brim. Filled so that there's a meniscus of the power of God, more than you can actually, God can, God's got plenty to give, no shortage. You know, if you're not filled with the Spirit and you wanna be filled, you should be running out the front right now. That's what I believe. The invitation, see God wants to cue you for your miracle. You want joy in your life instead of miserable sadness and you know, being a drag on everybody? You need to be filled with the Spirit. You need to speak in tongues more regularly than you do. You know, earlier I mentioned about you know, all the different things. Obedience brings about the joy. Somewhere you will have the joy of the Lord when you walk in obedience. But if you walk in disobedience, you can expect the fruit and the evidence of disobedience, which will be sadness and misery and, and all kinds of horrible attitudes. You can change who you are by simply making a decision. Cho choose you this day whom you will serve. Hallelujah. Let's stand in the presence of God. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us at the Royals YouTube channel. Make sure you like, comment and subscribe. If that blessed you, make sure you share it with a family member or friend. We can't wait to see you next time for another glorious gathering.